Welcome to the new podcast, In the Garden with Susan. I'm your host, Susan Ladner. I will aim to bring you top quality information on how to save open pollinated seeds, grow a garden, and preserve what you grow. Every Wednesday, I'll be sharing practical tips and techniques to help you on your journey to food security. Join me as I preserve the abundance of produce that my garden provides. Learn new ways of putting food away for the winter and some old ways that are from another century. You can find this podcast on Shopify and at my website. Come on, let's go wander down to the garden and awaken the dreams, history, and love that is held inside every seed. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of In the Garden with Susan. And I am not sure if when you're hearing this that I was able to get an intro in or an outro. I'm experiencing massive difficulties. Um, it, it, this is the biggest gong show ever. This is my third recording. Like I, I have recorded this twice already. And the first time it just, it disappeared from my anchor FM. I'm not even sure it, it just was gone. I, I know that they're switching over from anchor FM saying we have to use Riverside. And I've tried now to use Riverside and it doesn't work for me. And so now I just did some research how to get my OBS to record into a MP4 to move it into my anchor so I can get it onto Spotify. And I know you guys do not need to be hearing this. I just have to give you a little background on what sort of a gong show I'm living in. And now I'm trying to get my music <laughs> into this OBS. And so I just want everyone to know I'm not technical. And so please excuse any difficulties with today's show. But we're going to move forward because, you know, the show must go on. I guess that's, and I really need to get into the garden. And so, but I want to get this out. So, and especially because I've recorded it twice already. And it's really interesting information. So here we go. I really hope you're hearing this. I really hope this, this makes it. And so if you just, if, if all the bells and whistles are not included with today's show, please excuse me. I'm going to try and figure this out. Um, maybe when it rains, I'll figure this out. So what I we're going to finish off on our alliums. And I really want to go back and I want to make an apology. In one of my previous show, I said that there was just only one variety of Egyptian walking onions. And then I was thinking about it and I was remembering my garden in Ontario. And no, that I had three different kinds of walking onions. Um, and so, and I was like, I, and I have the red Catawissa. I just ordered them uh, a couple weeks ago and they're coming to me in midsummer. And so we're going to go back. And for any of my new listeners that are just hearing this, um, the Egyptian walking onions are, they're a perennial plant in the onion family. And they're called walking because they propagate themselves by forming small bubbles on the top of its stalks. And as the bulbs grow larger, the stalks will become top heavy and they'll bend over. And then when they get to the ground, they'll take root. And so they can walk across your garden. And if you don't take care of them, they will walk everywhere. And so the red Catawissa, um, as the name suggests, their bulbs have, they, they have a reddish bulbs and they're medium size and they have a deep red to um, a purple color and they are extremely hardy and the bulbs and the green stalks of the red Catawissa Egyptian walking onion are edible and the flavor is similar to shallots or green onions and um, the greens can be used like chives and so you propagate them, they, they will produce the clusters of small bulbs called bubbles, and they're at the top of the stalks. And so they don't produce flowers that they just make these little bubbles. And when they become too heavy, they'll, they'll fall over and then plant themselves in the soil. But you can eat those little bulbs up there. And the red Catawissa, those bubbles are larger than any, well, I've only grown three varieties of 
Egyptian walking onions, but the red catawissa had the largest bulbs. And I remember I used to use them as uh, like red onions in salads. They're, they're really nice flavor. And it's really great when you don't have any red onions and things. And so they are a perennial and they, they can be used in many things, salads, soups, stir fries, and they can also be used pickled. And so there's a few other varieties that I found as I started doing a little bit more digging around. You have your basic top setting onion, which is your standard variety of Egyptian walking onion. And then there is the Moses's onions, and they are also known as tree onions. And they have larger bubbles that resemble miniature onions. And they have this name because they are said to have been carried by the Israelites during the exodus from Egypt. And then we have a variety called the red walking onion. And it is similar to the red catawissa variety. And they have reddish purple bulbs. And they are prized as an ornamental variety. There's also the golden walking onion and the white walking onion. And then we have, and so those as their names say, you know, the golden walking onion has golden yellow coloration and the white walking onion has white bulbs. And then there's something called the, the French shallot tree onion. And it's not technically a separate variety, but some growers consider French shallots to be a type of Egyptian walking onion. And they produce a uh, small bulb similar to walk, other walking onions. And I just want to make a little note in here that as I have been researching the perennial alliums, I'm finding that there's some overlap and it kind of really is about what the person, what some people think about it. You know, like there's really no clear defined, like things sort of seep into each other. Like they can be in one category and the other. And we're going to see that with a few of these varieties um, and groupings that I talk about. And so then we also have a variety called the brown catawissa. And they have white and red bands and brown skin. And that is an 1859 heirloom. And just a side note, you can find those guys in the Seed Savers Exchange. And then there's the McCullers White Top Set. And I believe on, I believe on the farm in Ontario, I had a variety called Fleener's Top Set. Um, so anyway, there's quite a few of the different Egyptian walking onions. And now we, I, I have a discovery that I find very exciting. And I actually today just finalized this. Um, it's on its way to me this week, these seeds from a seed saver down in the States. I found when, when I researched this and I, I found this variety, I was like, what, what is this? It's, it's called the curret. And it's also known as an Egyptian leek. And some people call it an Egyptian walking onion. And so it's a perennial vegetable that belongs to the onion family. And so I was like, I've never even heard of this. I need to find it. And I found it in the Seed Savers Exchange. And so it is coming. I, I can't wait. And it is a perennial plant. And so it produces multiple stalks and stems from a single bulb. And these stalks can regrow to varying heights and they're topped with clusters of bulbs or seeds and they have a flat leaf. Um, and so th what the flavor is a distinct garlic flavor. And so it's a little bit milder than garlic cloves. And when they bloom, the curret uh, produces small white flowers and they're very attractive to pollinators. And it takes about 65 days for it to reach maturity from seed. And because it's a perennial, it's going to continue to produce foliage and bubbles year after year once it's established. And so, yeah, exciting. And now we come to shallots. And I know I, I talked a little bit about shallots in a previous podcast. And it, it's, um, we're going to get into it a little bit more because I didn't quite finish it off. And I, I think I was some of those varieties I talked about, I don't know if they were perennials. I, I've gotten, 
I've become a little overwhelmed in this allium that the whole alliums as as a whole when you get into the perennials and then the alliums and there's so much different information out there um and you know things that it depends on you know who thinks what about certain things where they should be placed and so the parent like the perennial shallots um it, and this is interesting because they can be known as perennial multiplying onions or they're sometimes also called perennial multiplier onions and it's it's a type of shallot but it's not like traditional shallots because it'll grow perennially and i think in the past i've actually grown perennial shallots because it did start clustering but I didn't know it was a perennial. I dug them up every year and I was always like, why are these all like, it was just a big cluster. And so it's quite interesting. I think maybe some of us have grown perennial shallots and we didn't even know just because they might not have been classified. We, you know, when we received them, we didn't know what we had. And so they're not, they're traditional shallots. They are grown as an annual and they need to be replanted year after year. However, the perennial shallots have the ability to grow year after year without needing to be replanted. And once they're established, they can continue to produce new shoots and bulbs season after season. And so the propagation, uh, basically they're just going to form clusters of small bulbs, similar to other types of multiplying onions and they will develop underground and can be harvested and replanted to expand the patch or to be shared with others or her to eat and they are they have a flavor similar to traditional shallots it's a mild onion flavor that's sweeter and more delicate than regular onions and these can be sauteed roasted pickled or used raw and in salads and they prefer well-drained soil and full sun, but they can also tolerate partial shade. And they are a relatively low maintenance plant and are generally pest and disease resistant. And so to harvest them, you can harvest them throughout the growing season when you need them. And the green tops can be snipped off and used like chives. And the bulbs can be harvested when they reach the desired size. And so we have um, quite a few different varieties of these guys. There are the red French, sorry, the French red shallot. And it is prized for its mild, sweet flavor and distinctive reddish purple skin. And it produces clusters of small bulbs that are perfect for adding depth of flavor to a wide range of dishes. And then we have the gray shallot, and it's also known as Griselle. And this variety has elongated bulbs with grayish brown skin, and it has a slightly stronger flavor as compared to the other shallot varieties. And some people say it's exquisite. And so it is best planted in the fall like garlic, and uh, because they'll only keep one to three months, they are challenging to peel, I guess. However, the flavor is worth it. And if you want to keep these guys longer, you just slice them and freeze them. And so if you're going to find those guys to get them to grow them, you can only find the sets um, in the fall, in September. And then we have the Dutch yellow shallot. And it is characterized by its golden yellow skin. And it has a delicate flavor with a hint of sweetness. And it produces medium-sized bulbs. And it's very versatile. And then we have... And uh, these guys are actually growing in my garden right now. They're just little tiny guys out there. And these are the Ed's Red Shallot. And it's a popular variety of a perennial shallot known for its rich flavor and attractive appearance. And it has a complex and robust flavor. It's slightly spicy with a sweet taste and subtle hints of garlic. Um... It produces medium to large size bulbs with reddish brown skin and white to purplish flesh. And the bulbs have a distinctive teardrop shape and are visibly appealing both in the garden and on the plate. And so they're perennial. They grow like other perennial shallots. In, they grow in clusters and small bulbs. 
and uh, they're very easy to propagate and harvest. And so they can be used like other shallots and they, they grow very well in Canadian gardens. And they can, uh, they can handle some, some partial shade. And so really when you're growing the perennial shallots, um, you're going to want to protect them in the winter. And so you're going to want to apply a thick layer of mulch or straw around the plants to insulate the soil and protect the bulbs from freezing temperatures. And then remove the mulch in early spring once the danger of frost has passed. And I would even like totally, you know, cover the entire plant because I know sometimes when when we're going, you know, we can hit minus 30, minus 35. It can get even colder in some places. So you really want to give it a lot of protection there. And uh, yeah, so using them in the kitchen, you can, you know, to harvest them. Basically with the perennial shallots, they will be ready to harvest when the tops begin to yellow and fall over. And that's usually in the late summer. And you'll carefully lift the bulbs with a fork and shake off the extra soil. And they can be used raw, cooked, or pickled. And so now we're going to get into something that the, the perennial potato onions. And these are also known as perennial multiplier onions or potato onions. And they grow perennially and they will propagate themselves by producing clusters of small bulbs underground and um they yeah they they don't need to be replanted um they're just going to continue to produce new bulbs and foliage season after season and uh they're similar to the perennial shallots as they grow the small clusters of bulbs underground and they can be harvested and replanted to expand the patch or to be moved to other locations or shared with other gardeners or eat. <laughs> and um, the potato onions typically have larger bulbs compared to shallots and they have a shape that resemble potatoes and that's why they're called the potato onions. And they have multiple layers and they can vary in color from white to yellow to reddish brown depending on the variety. And so perennial potato onions have a mild, sweet flavor that is similar to shallots, but it's slightly milder. And they're very versatile in the kitchen. You can add them to soups, stews, stir fries, and salads. And so they also, they like well-drained soil and full sun, but they can tolerate partial shade and they're very low maintenance and they're disease and pest resistant and so um yeah that also one thing with them you can use the green tops and they can be used like chives or green onions which and then you can take the bulbs when they then when they're at the size that you like and so varieties with them we have the yellow potato onion and it has yellow skin and white to yellowish flesh. And it has a mild sweet flavor. There's the red potato onion. And it has reddish brown skin and white to reddish flesh. And it has a slightly stronger flavor than the yellow variety. There's the white potato onion. And it's also known as silver skin. And this variety produces bulbs with white skin and white flesh. And it has a very mild flavor. And it's usually used in pickling. Um, and then there's the red, or sorry, the French shallot potato onion. And it's similar to traditional shallots. And it produces elongated bulbs with a reddish brown skin and purple tinged flesh. And it has a complex flavor profile. And so yeah, I guess it's very prized in gourmet cooking. And then there's the Dutch yellow shallot potato onion. And this variety forms round, uniform bulbs with yellow skin and white to yellowish flesh. And it has a mild sweet flavor. And then there is the Zatau yellow potato onion. And I hope I said that right. And this one, it originates from Germany and it produces round, yellow skinned bulbs with a mild sweet flavor 
and it is known for its excellent storage qualities. And then there is the Catawissa shallot potato onion, and it produces elongated bulbs with reddish brown skin and a mild sweet flavor. And so, and it's really good at storage. So, and then we also have the green mountain potato onion. And I guess this one is very popular. And it produces round to slightly flattened bulbs with yellow brownish skin and white to yellowish flesh. And the bulbs can vary in size, but they're generally medium to large in size. And so they have a mild sweet flavor and it has subtle onion uh, undertones, but it, it's, it does not taste like traditional onions. And so very versatile. Um, and so basically you can propagate it like everything else. And we have now, and this is one I have, it is the Andes Green Mountain Multiplier Onion. And it is a selection from the Green Mountain Potato Onions. And so Andy, he must have popularized it and he must have, you know, spent quite a few years selecting it for some desirable traits. Um, I look forward to seeing how that guy grows because I really wanted some, I really wanted some potato onions and I was searching and, um, in my search, this is, this is one I, I found that I could, could get because I mean, it's hard, it's hard to get some of these guys because you can't move them across the borders. So that guy came in a seed and next year, the man who had that variety. He said next year he may have some different varieties of the potato onion seeds for me. And now um, the perennial. So yeah, I think basically that's the perennial potato onions, you know. Um, very, very, I I just, I'm very interested in them. Um, and, and I did grow potato onions back in the farm in Ontario. And I just, I just had a, I didn't know there was different. It was just called the potato onion when I had it. That's the only thing I knew. Maybe it was one of those varieties. So, and we're going to now, we're getting into something. I know it's not a perennial vegetable. However, it is in the allium group. And I just want to finish this all off. I, I'm actually kind of excited to be getting out of the alliums, although I love them so much. And I, I, I really found this journey fasinating and I've, I found some amazing varieties and on my hunts and I've acquired some great perennial seeds because of looking into all of this. Um, but I just want to finish it off with an herb. And so we're going to talk about chives and you know, it, it's just like chives, chives are chives. So, <laughs> but, and that's what I thought, but I've made a few discoveries while I was researching them and um, they are a perennial herb. They're known for their delicate texture, mild onion flavor, and they're very easy to cultivate. And so they're, it's a favorite in herb gardens and culinary uses. And they, they're in the allium flat family, you know, along with the onions, garlic, and leeks. And so for varieties, we have the common chives. And this is the standard variety, and it has slender, hollow stems and a mild onion flavor. And then we have garlic chives, and these are also known as Chinese chives, and they have a flat leaf and a subtle garlic flavor, and it's very different from the flavor to traditional chives. And then we have the Forscati chives, and they are noted for their pink flowers, and they, they have a similar flavor to common chives. And now we have a variety called the Anne Petro garlic chives and I know nothing at all about these. I actually have these growing in the garden right now and I acquired them from the Seed Savers Exchange and these were seeds that someone had donated to the exchange and so they know nothing about it. So I'm growing them out and I'll see and and uh, soon I will have these seeds available and I'll know more about them and um, they will be in the Seed Savers Exchange and also in my collection if anybody would like them. And then now we have a variety called the Blushing Beauty and they have attractive purple flowers and they have a garlic flavor. Um, then there's the Geisha 
and it is a very vigorous variety and it has a very strong garlic flavor. And so we're going back into the chives now. I know I probably should have kept the chives with the chives, but the this is something I just, I never knew that there were so many varieties of chives. And there's a variety called the Siberian chives and it's native to Siberia and it has broader leaves than the common chives. And it produces clusters of small lilac colored flowers. And then we have the gi giant Siberian chives. And these guys are larger than Siberian chives. And they have broader leaves and taller flower stalks. And so there's also the Starro chives. And they are a variety with twisted curly leaves. And they have a milder flavor than compared to the common chives. And they're, they're also used as ornaments in gardens, in addition to their edible qualities. And then there are the Czech chives. And this variety has slender, flat leaves and produce clusters of small white flowers. And they have a mild garlic flavor. And then there are curly chives, and they're similar to starro chives, and they have twisted leaves, and so they add an attractive texture to dishes, and they're very interesting in the garden. And just to let you know, I will have all these varieties and everything I talk about in the show notes below, and I will also include their Latin names because all of these have a little bit of different Latin names, but I'm not... I'm not going to torture us all with my with my attempts to pronunciate them. So I'm just I'm just admitting that from the the podcast, but it will be in the show notes. And so um, I want to talk about the difference between the garlic chives and regular chives, um, because the the garlic chives they are very distinct from the the chive varieties, and um, you know they. They share some of the similarities, but they have some unique ones. And the most unique difference uh, of the garlic chives to common chives is the flavor. And, you know, they have a strong garlic flavor. And so they're, they're more popular where, you know, you want to have some garlic. And, you know, you can, they cook better. So you can fry them up. Like the, the chives don't really hold well you know putting them in stir fries and things like that they, they're not going to go very well but the frying up the garlic chives works really well and it's amazing i i just loved fry you know frying them up with other vegetables it goes really well and so um yeah they've got a long history they're, they've culturally been used in the Asian culture, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese dishes for a long time. They're used in stir fries, dumpling soups, and salads. And they have a more vigorous growing habit than the common chives, and they can spread more aggressively in the garden. And the garlic chives produce a white star-shaped flower in late summer or early fall whereas common chives will produce edible flower, um, edible purple flowers. And uh, yeah, they've got a little bit of a different texture. You know, they're hardier. And so, um, you know, you can use the garlic chives in tempura also. And they sometimes put them in pancakes and omelets and also fritters. And uh, you can freeze them if you want to be you know putting them away you can put them in the freezer you can also dry them you can infuse them into vinegar and um, so you'll want to chop the garlic chives or even the chives into small pieces and put them in a clean sterilized glass jar you're going to heat the vinegar such as white wine vinegar or apple cider vinegar in a saucepan until it's just about to boil and then you'll pour the hot vinegar over the chopped chives into the jar and make sure they're fully submerged. And then seal the jar tightly, let it cool to room temperature. And then you're going to put it in a dark place for one to two weeks and allow the flavors to develop. 
and then you'll strain out the chive pieces and put the infused vinegar into a clean and sterilized bottle for long-term use. And that can be used in salad dressing, marinades, um, or in sauces and dips. And this is something, this was my big discovery about chives. And I am so glad that I did this little dive into chives. And maybe my listeners, maybe you guys know about this, but I didn't know. You can make pesto out of chives. Like, I, I, you know, maybe I should have known this, but I am going to be making some pesto this week after I take the flowers off or um, I'll make some, I'm going to make some flour. I'm going to put the, the the chive flowers into some white wine vinegar and uh when they fully open and i'm going to infuse some of that i i saw a little video on that and that looks really delicious for salads but um then you can combine the chopped chives or garlic chives with some nuts such as pine nuts or walnuts um, i started even making some pesto last year with cashews and maybe you know even for echo you know, economic sake, you can even try it with sunflowers I or sunflower seeds. I don't know. And then you're going to want to put some grated Parmesan cheese in there. I will not be using that. I'll put some nutritional yeast. And then you can add some garlic and olive oil into a food processor. Blend it all until smooth and add more olive oil to reach your desired consistency. And you can season it with salt and pepper and transfer it into an airtight container and store it in the fridge for up to one week or you can freeze it. And what I do, I'll make a whole bunch of pesto up and I'll put it in the one cup glass jars and I'll put them in the freezer. And so, and then if you're working with the basil, I always put a layer of garlic or olive oil on the top so it keeps it from turning brown. But yeah, you know, how amazing is that? And so chive pesto can be used as a spread, pasta sauce, or it can be used as a topping for grilled meats. And it can also be put with vegetables. And so then we also know we can make chive butter. I think we all know about making chive butter. So that is it. We have come to the conclusion of the perennial alliums. And I hope everybody found it as interesting as I do. And um, I hope you're all enjoying this week. It's a very busy time in the garden. <laughs> it's, you know, um, I'm just going to do the out row now because I do have to get to the garden. And I, I have a friend of mine. He just gave me some, um, elect some electroculture exactly as Yannick Van Duren has suggested. And so I have these long 50 foot, um, 50 foot uh, coils, um, and there is the magnet on the end that will go on the south end, and it's sealed with beeswax. So I'm able, and you place these, um, the, you place the the coils. They're three feet apart, so I'll unroll, unroll unroll the coil and I believe it goes 50 feet so I can and then three feet across and I have three of them so I'm going to go and grid that out into the garden and so I'll have some interesting electroculture going on so I'm sure everybody is very busy right now and you can find this podcast at my rumble channel it's also on my youtube channel and it's at my website at www dot garden fairy botanicals dot ca i hope you all have a lovely week next week we're going to get back into perennial vegetables there's still a few to cover and then i think we will be done with the perennials and so i will see you in the garden <music>